Our program committee is the absolutely marvelous group of people who have put together a, just a great series of programs over the course of the last year. Judy Floyd is on that committee. Linda Barlett, wave your hand, Linda, is on that committee. Um, Betty Batchelder is, and Dick Flanders. And that group of four have done a gigantic amount of work. So, wait. So, I'm just going to give you some quick details about some programs coming up, and then we will go right to our speaker. Uh, we have three things, three events coming in, in the next month or so. Not this Saturday, but a week from this Saturday, we're going to be having a plant sale right here at the Historical Society. Out there, it's going to be sunny and beautiful, <laughs> not too hot, not too. And we're going to raise a lot of money because that's what that is all about. Um, if any of you have plants you would like to donate to that sale, we'll be taking them on Friday the day before from 9 to 11 in the morning and from 4 to 6 in the afternoon. And if you're a gardener, please do come and see. We've got some lovely things that are going to be there at bargain price. So that's on the 27th. On the 21st of June, we'll be having our next program. Uh, Roger Ellsworth and Evan McGorka will be presenting Whispering Pines, the Keniston Saga, and those of you who have lived in Plymouth will know that Keniston name. John Keniston was one of the larger-than-life characters here in town, and Roger is his, his great-grandson, and Roger and Eva live in the beautiful 1890s house they built up on the hill, um, up on Langdon Road. And so you'll learn all kinds of wonderful facts about the history of that period and also about the family. So that's the 21st of June, and then we'll wrap up our programs until into the fall on the 12th of June when Thomas Huppicut comes to talk about his book, and I always get this wrong, Big House, Little House, Bath House Barn, <laughs> which is the connected buildings of New England farms. And that is apparently something very unique in New England. So we'll hear lots about that. We've done other farm programs this year. Had to postpone one that will be coming hopefully later this fall. Um, let me think. We have a guest book in the back. Uh, if you are not receiving, if you have email and you do not get a uh, notices about the programs, please sign that guest book and, and get your email address there. If you do not do email and you just want to receive a card by the mail, put your home address. We do send out a, a handful of cards to people who don't want to should do the email, but we prefer the email only because it, it doesn't uh, cost us an arm and a leg. And while you're back there, you just might find on that table a nice little jar that says donations. <laughs> If anybody who feels able, that would be wonderful because that helped us to keep all the programs and things going. So, um, tonight, oh my goodness, what a pleasure to be able to introduce David Sakura and what a wonderful and unusual opportunity. I expect that most of us grew up as I did reading about Japanese internment camps in the history books but I have never talked with anybody who lived that experience or heard any kind of really first-hand account of how it was to be really a persecuted Japanese-American in this country. So um, it is with great respect that I introduce David Sakura. He and his wife Mary Ellen moved to New Hampshire after they retired. It is truly our game, and we are so honored to have you with us. Well, uh, first of all, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Is it warm enough for you? <laughs> uh, but Kathy, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm a little at lost at being here at the Plymouth Historical Society why I'm speaking before the society and, and the members, but I figured out that I'm an honorary New Englander. 
<laughs> so it, it gives me a, uh, a right to speak before this very august body. <laughs> but, uh, but Kathy, thank you very much and for the society for inviting me. But before I begin, I'd like to uh, explain a few terminologies, uh, Japanese terminologies, if you will. As you know, J Japanese like to uh, quantify, they like to label things. And one thing that is especially important for me as a third generation Japanese is that I'm called a sansei. So if I meet someone on the street and they'll say, well, how, how are you? What, what are you? And I'll say, I'm a sansei. I'm a third generation. And when I talk about the first generation, like my grandfather, he's a Issei, number one. My father was born in this country. He's a Nisei, number two. And I'm a Sansei, number three. My children are Yonsei, number four. And my grandchildren are Gosei. So when you go home, you can, you can repeat yourself. Nisei, Nisei, Sansei, Yonsei, Gosei. Now I have to explain a little bit about this photograph. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was surfing through uh, on the internet and I came across the Bancroft Library that had over 10,000 photographs of the internment. And I was looking at a number of photographs and suddenly Mary Ellen, my wife, came and said, David, that's you! <laughs> and I looked at that and sure enough, there I was in the collection of the Bancroft Library. And this photograph was taken as we were coming off the train after we were transported from Seattle to our our final uh, detention camp. Uh, secondly, uh, I came across uh, uh, an article by the former editor of the Eatonville Dispatch. We grew up before the war in Eatonville, Washington, and this editor had written about my father and about the letters he had written from the camps back to his hometown newspaper during the war. And he talked all, uh, quite a bit about the experiences of, of the family and what it was like living in the camps. And so I contacted the editor, Dixie Walters, and she and I corresponded, and she sent me the entire uh, collection of my father's letters. Oh. And so I, I read those letters, and it, it brought back lots of memories, including a, a, uh, a letter he wrote describing this incident. When we were coming off the train, a photographer came, took the boy's picture, and, and uh, so bringing two things together, here's the picture in the Bancroft collection. Here's my father's description of when that picture was taken, and I'll explain to you a little bit about my, my, uh, about my uh, uh, experiences around this photograph. Now, my wife is my, my, my uh, projectionist, so can we, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. Well, this story begins uh, in a uh, small village in uh, the southern tip of the main island of Japan. This is where my grandfather was born in Suwano, in Shimane Ken Shimane Prefecture in 1869. In the next slide, you'll see a photograph of where it's located. He was born in this little village high in the mountains. And I must say, I, I think the reason I'm speaking here is that Shima, uh, Suwano is very much like Plymouth, New Hampshire. It's located in the hills, there are mountains nearby, and there's a beautiful river running right through. So I feel vindicated that I'm speaking before the historical society. My, father, my grandfather was born in 1869. That was the beginning of the Meiji Restoration. That, that was when Admiral Perry opened up Japan, and Japan began to enter into the modern era. And it was almost coincidental that my grandfather was born at the very beginning of the Meiji Restoration. In the next slide, <coughs> here's a photograph of, uh, of Suwano. And uh, if you close your eyes or look carefully, it looks sort of like Plymouth, New Hampshire. Um, my father, my grandfather, was approached by a Christian person and was handed a Bible. And as a result of reading the Bible and other materials, my grandfather converted to Christianity as a young man. 
And so it became a dream of his to fly away to the big country far away where the writing is from left to right. <laughs> and uh, so this, uh, this was found in a, uh, haik, uh, a haiku poem a whole set of these poems written by my grandfather are in the archives of the University of Washington. But it was his dream as a young man to come to the United States. So in 1869, 1889, in the next slide, my grandfather took a very perilous journey on a small boat across the North Atlantic and landed in Seattle in 1889. There he worked uh, an odd job, saved enough money so that he could send for a wife. And uh, there were many brokers at the time. There were only about 2,000 at the time in 1889. There were only about 2,000 Japanese in Seattle. In 1900, there were about 12,000 Japanese living in Seattle. And the Chinese were pretty much asked to leave Seattle and were run out of town. Uh, there were marriage brokers in Seattle that my grandfather met and uh, they looked through page after page of photographs of Japanese women who would like to come to the United States and to find a husband and that he was able to uh, sort it down to two women. <laughs> One was a Christian but she was not very attractive. <laughs> The other woman came from the Akita Prefecture, which is known for its very beautiful women. So he was really torn between beauty and his religious beliefs. And guess what he chose? Beauty. And my, grandfather, my grandmother Misa arrived in 1900. She traveled from Japan to Seattle and they met for the first time as she was coming down the gangplank from the ship. And the family lore goes as follows. Love blossom. <laughs> and uh, by, uh, by 1919, love certainly blossomed. <laughs> because they had nine children. Uh, the two older boys, uh, Ted and Tenny, were born in the early 1900s. My dad, Chester, was born in 1905 and by that time in 1905 my uh, grandfather had built a home uh, had built a home in South Seattle just south of the Boeing airfield in the sand flats and so Chester, my, my father, was, uh, was the first born and then came a succession of girls, Lulu, Alice, and Nellie, and others. So by, 19, by 1919, there were uh, nine in the family. But unfortunately, my grandfather passed away from, uh, from an accident in 1919, leaving my grandmother with all these children. The, the teenage boys went out to work. They traveled all around the country as carpenters, as, as laborers. Uh, Uncle Ted went to Alaska to mine for gold. And they supported the family. And as a result, my father was able to finish high school. Uh, my aunt uh, Lulu and, and uh, Nellie were able to fi finish high school. Lulu was a valedictorian in her high school. So they were the first in the family, second generation Mise, to finish high school and they were at the top of their class. In the next slide, we uh, move now to the, what I think is the golden era of our family from 1925 to the beginning of World War II. And uh, if we go to the next slide, I have to start a uh, home movie that I put together. And So this is uh, 1930 to 1942, and these were excerpted from home movies that uh, that my father was uh, had made. Uh, in 1925, my uncle Kenny, the oldest, 
was recruited as a baseball player to the Edenville Lumber Company, and in return was given a job at the lumber mill. And uh, actually, there uh, there were Japanese workers uh, working at the Edenville Lumber Company since 1910, and uh, so he brought my my uh, my father Chester along for company, and the both of them worked in the mill for about five years, uh, where my father earned enough money and was. Uh, able to court my mother, and uh, they were married in 1931 in Eatonville, uh, and they lived in the Japanese village on the grounds of the uh, lumber mill. Uh, my father in that previous picture gave my mother uh, a photograph of a little dog, and the dog's name was Puggy. It was a water spaniel, and that was his engagement gift to my, to my mother. My, my father was a first mover, and he learned to repair radios. Now, this, this is a photograph of my learning to take my driver's license. <laughs> and this, is a, this gives you a feel for the, the uh, Japanese village that we lived in. There were about 100 Japanese, uh, uh, Americans of Japanese ancestry. And by 1940, my father was making the princely sum of about $2,000 a year. He was able to buy a new car. We were well on the way of entering into the, the uh, middle class. Um, and of course, I'm the firstborn, so all the photographs are of me. <laughs> but uh, uh, during the 1930s, my, my Aunt Nellie, and uh, my aunt, uh, uh, let's see, Alice, uh, both went to the Eatonville High School, and Aunt Nellie was also a valedictorian. My mother loved sewing, so she she would create these costumes for us. And this was my brother Jerry and myself. Jerry was born in 1939, so he's about he's a toddler. And my father would would make these uh, annual Christmas cards and uh, with my mother making the appropriate costumes. So she loved dressing the boys all alike. It was a wonderful time living in, in the Japanese village. There were about a hundred of us. Most of them worked in the mill. Of the 30 men that worked in the mill, 40 were Japanese American, Japanese or Japanese Americans. They all were, uh, earned a, uh, a, a union wage. Uh, and we had all the amenities of a Japanese village, including a bathhouse and, and the like. This is a, a, a film clip of a, a August moon picnic, about 1939. Uh, my mother was able to meet with the other families in the, uh, in the uh, village. Uh, it was a time of great festivities. Uh, the obligatory baseball game. And you can see parts of the mill in the back. This is a three-legged race that required a great deal of collaboration between husband and wife. Uh, and uh, of course, the teenage boys. And there were uh, quite a few children and teenagers in the village. This is the, uh, this is the obstacle race uh, where the men are racing. But what, uh, what I find interesting are the children that are watching and are cheering on the participants. So this, this was a, these are some of the uh, younger men of the village and they were practicing all year for this beer bottle racing. <laughs> they seem to have done very well with that <laughs> The next scene shows a, uh, a uh, soy sauce barrel race. And it, it, it astounds me that this little village could drink so much soy sauce <laughs> to have a race. Uh, I, I'm always amazed that these young men and I can see why they were uh, very good in the mill. They, they, they could run with one leg around the race course. And in this final event, uh, we have my, uh, my dad, Chester, uh, cheering on my mother, where the mothers will race, put on their apron, and pick up the children and bring them home. But you can see in the background the, uh, the lumber mill. And it's, I think it's very similar to living in uh, Lincoln or any other mill town where you have sheds, you have sawmills, the green chain mill, and the like. This is my uh, kindergarten photograph taken in April 1942 after World War II began. Uh, you can see me on the right-hand side. Somebody tried to uh, touch up the uh, photograph. 
but my nose came off. <laughs> but in two weeks after that photograph, we were in detention camp. So in the next slide, right on. <laughs> Uh, so as you, as you know, uh, World War II began with the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941. And by February 1941, uh, 1942, uh, there was such an outcry among people on the West Coast that against the Japanese. They were fearful that the Japanese were, would become saboteurs and that they would uh, revert back to their loyalty to, uh, to the emperor. And this, this outcry grew louder and louder until in February of 1942, February 19th, almost 70, in fact, 75 years ago, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the executive, the executive order. And all of you know what executive orders are. <laughs> he signed executive order 9066, which allowed the Secretary of uh, the uh, uh, War and his delegate to remove any individual from the military zone. And within uh, a few weeks, uh, General DeWitt declared the entire West Coast as a military zone and began issuing a number of directives, about a hundred of these directives that began to close in on the Japanese community. I can remember my father talking late at night with friends about where should they go? Should we move inland? But if we move inland, who will take us? And will they be against us if we move there? And how are we gonna support ourselves? So we stayed in our village and until finally the order came in May of 1942 that we were to order to we were ordered to report to a detention camp. We only had two weeks to prepare. Uh, we had to dispose of all our personal goods or put in the storage, uh, and to try to counteract this war hysteria against the Japanese Americans. My father joined the. Uh, Eatonville Committee of the Japanese American Citizens League shortly after the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and they pledged their wholehearted support to our country, the United States of America, to our community, our leaders, and for all the principles for which they stand, including the right of a fair trial um, and all the rights that we were assured of under the Constitution, which apparently were lifted in Executive Order 9066. Uh, this was all, uh, it, it, it was pretty much ignored and here's the sign that uh, alerted the population that we were to report to a detention center. In the next slide, this is a little clipping from the Eatonville Dispatch. The editor of the dispatch was a friend of my father and my father and he agreed that if he would write letters from the detention camps, he would publish them in real time as they were written, unedited. And so this was a very courageous uh, stand by the editor uh, because there was such a, uh, uh, an outcry against the, the Japanese. So here's a small clipping that uh, was published on May 4th, 1942 just a few weeks after my kindergarten photograph was taken. And it read as follows, the evacuation may take place at any time before May 17th. A number have already gone joining parents and relatives before being located in places of concentration. Now some people have argued that this is a detention camp. Some people have argued that this is a concentration camp. And we can discuss that if, if you wish. But whatever it was, it wasn't very nice. <laughs> Next. So this is what uh, General DeWitt uh, allowed us to do, only what we could carry. So evacuees must carry with them on departure for the assembly center the following, bedding and linens, no mattresses. Straw mattresses will be provided uh, 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 to each member of the family. Toilet articles, extra clothing, sufficient knives, forks, spoons, 
and essential personal effects for each family. And that's it. So I asked the high school students, if you were only given one week to report to the Sandwich County Fair, Sandwich Fairgrounds, what would you carry? And most would say, well, I carry my laptop. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we couldn't carry cameras, radios, any electronic gear for fear of sabotage. So think about what your family would go through if all of you were notified that in two weeks you had to dispose or store your cars, your personal items, everything. Wow. Next slide. So my father in a letter in 1974, we sold much of our goods but at a very much of uh, a uh, loss. A good friend stored the more valuable items that we didn't sell. And I have to say that after the war, we never saw anything. The car was gone, and all our household, all our personal effects gone. This photograph is really, uh, I've had a hard time preparing this talk because this photograph and another photograph I'll, I'll explain to you really resonated with me. Uh, my mother loved to, uh, to sew. So she would, she would sew these matching shirts for my brother Jerry on the left and myself on the right with matching shorts. So we would be dressed uh, very lovingly by the, with the clothes that my mother made. My dog Puggy, who you saw in, in, in the film clip, has now grown up and has become a member of our family. Puggy was left behind with a friend. And we asked after the war, what happened to Puggy? And the friend said, well, Puggy would sit in the front yard every day waiting for us to come back. And we never came back. And he died of a broken heart. In the next slide, we now shift to our internment experience. So I wanted to give you a little flavor of what it was like pre-World War II, the fact that I think we were moving well up the social economic ladder, things were very comfortable, and suddenly we were put into a detention camp, 1942 and 1944. This photograph shows people actually getting off the bus uh, at the Piala uh, Fairgrounds. Uh, the, the Army called it euphemistically Camp Harmony. <laughs> there were 7,000 of us uh, housed temporarily at Camp Harmony. The Army was very proud of the fact that each resident, not an internee, each resident had 50 square feet of space. It's a 5 by 10 feet of space, uh, personal space. I can remember getting off the bus, watching all these people lined up against the fence and we went inside the camp. We were we were fingerprinted. I was six years old. I can still remember the FBI fingerprinting me, giving me a number. It's like 17521. And we were assigned to a stall, and we filled up our mattresses with straw to sleep on army pots in an animal stall. It was whitewashed, but that was it. My father wrote in his letter, his first dispatch from Camp Harmony, about 50 persons loaded on a large North Coast Line bus in front of Eatonville on Saturday, May 16th. Quite recently, I spoke to an elderly gentleman who was there when, we, when the Japanese from the community were being loaded on the bus. He ran down to the, uh, to the loading area, saw a soldier with a rifle, uh, and went up to the soldier and asked him, what is happening here? And the soldier replied, it's none of your business. <laughs> and I, I ask now, if this were to happen again, would it be none of our business? Would we stand by? People were astounded that suddenly the Japanese community was gone. And so, in modern day times, would we stand by and make it none of our business? Uh, this is Father Tibisar, who was a senior uh, from uh, the Marinol Order. He actually went to the camps and served as a messenger between the camps 
and and the uh, the folks, uh, the friends at home in Seattle, brought their personal goods, brought the necessary things. There were other, there were Buddhist priests. Uh, my grandfather started the Japanese Baptist Church in uh, Seattle, and the first Caucasian minister was uh, moved to uh, to the camps to uh, minister to his flock because there was nobody left at the Japanese Baptist Church. Next slide. This is a view of Camp Harmony, and Chet, in uh, my father in his uh, letter, uh, described we were confined behind barbed wire fences and high security, high sentry lookout towers. There were 7,000 people in this fairground. They were camped out on the fairgrounds in, in the open space. They were camped underneath the, the, uh, the uh, grandstands. We were housed in, in uh, horse stables. They, uh, it was, uh, the population I think of Plymouth, it's about 7,000, 6,700. It would be as if everybody in Plymouth were rounded up and put into a detention camp. Hastily put together, uh, I can remember my uh, my brother Jerry, who was about two and a half years old. He, I can remember him crying uh, incessantly. He would cry until he had no voice left. And he, all I can remember now is this sort of hacking sound, this pitiful hacking sound of a of a child that was totally traumatized. But I also think about my mother sitting in the dark of a horse stall with a child that won't stop crying. It must have been very, very difficult for, for parents. In the next slide, what was waiting for us were permanent detention camps. There were 10 uh, of these internment camps, as they were called, and they were spread out throughout all of the western states away from the military uh, exclusion area. <coughs> You see that there's Topaz, Tule Lake, Minidoka, Heart Mountain, uh, Granada, uh, uh, there's one in uh, Yuma, Arizona, and another one in Arkansas. These were hastily built camps to house over 110,000 Japanese Issei, Nisei, and Sansei. Most of them were citizens of the United States. Two thirds were children that were interned in these detention camps. So there was a lot of talk about what's, where, where are we going, what's going to happen to us, how can we get out of Camp Harmony, and this is what was waiting for us. Next slide. This is a view of Minidoka that's being constructed. It was under construction in 1942. Uh, Minidoka was carved out of 30,000 square acres of raw desert land, sagebrush, rattlesnakes, dust, and there were some 600 buildings that were hastily constructed. About 400 of these buildings were barracks to house the internees. They, they were arranged in blocks. There were 36 blocks of 12 barracks each. These barracks had no insulation. They were tar paper covered. They had no air conditioning. And they were divided into rooms based on size of family. We had a fairly large family, so we had a large room. But I remember our next door neighbor was a couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Baba. They had a tiny room in the barracks. There were some 600 barracks uh, arranged in 36 blocks. And there were 12, uh, 12 barracks per block with a central wash facility, uh, toilet facilities, and a mess hall. We had no running water. Uh, we barely had heat. And there was no hot water in the, uh, in, the day, uh, in the bathhouse until well into the winter. So we arrived around September, but no hot water until almost Thanksgiving. There, was, there were over 900 buildings, uh, various administrative uh, buildings, including schools uh, and farm equipment uh, areas and the like. My father wrote 
In his first letter from Minnedoka, the internment camp, we couldn't leave the windows open because of the dust and cinders, so the heat was pretty bad. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we came to a halt at the end of the line. It took us 30 hours, a day and a, a little more than a day, to travel the 800 miles. The train itself was an antiquated train. It was uh, commandeered, if you will, away from the troop trains and was given low priority, so we crept along all through the day heading eastbound to a destination that we don't we, we had no idea and i can remember as a child uh, we had to draw the shades down so no one could look out conversely no one could look in and we had armed guards on the train if we had to go to the bathroom we had to ask a guard to come and and go with us to the bathroom and i can remember late in the evening I opened up the, the shade and I could smell the cool air. And it was just a wonderful experience, a, a, a smell of freedom, a smell of fresh air uh, inside of this stifling hot, hot uh, rail car. In the next slide, we have this photograph. And my father wrote in his letter back to the Eatonville Dispatch, we were greeted by officials and photographers, and one of them took a picture of the three kids looking out of the window. And this photograph ends up in the Bancroft collection, amongst the 10,000 photographs taken during the internment. There's my brother, uh, Jerry, who cried incessantly, myself, and uh, my, my little brother, Chester, who was about a year and a half. I remember getting off the train, and because we were, in, we were in darkness during the entire trip, I thought it was nighttime and the spotlights were, uh, were shining on us. But actually it was midday. And as I remember a soldier coming up to me and greeting me by name. He said, hi, David. And he had a rifle. He bent down and I looked up at him and he said, and I wondered, how did he know my name? We were all given name tags that we had to wear around uh, in front of us so we could be identified. Our name, our number, so that they could keep track of us. And remember, remember, I'm a Sanse. I'm a U.S. citizen. What happened? Anyway, let, uh, let's move on. Uh, my father wrote, our first reaction to Minidoka was that this taste for dust and the slightest breeze threw up clouds of dust and that certainly got us down, especially uh, uh, after a long, hard journey. You can see the sagebrush, which blew in big, big walls during, during sandstorms. Uh, the place was infested with, uh, with rattlesnakes. There would be an annual rattlesnake uh, uh, roundup, and uh, the men of the camp would go out amongst the sagebrush, and they would bring in dozens of rattlesnakes and hang them on, on, on the line for display. In the next slide, this is what greeted us, uh, a, a barrack room. It was about a, a 20 by 20 room for a large family. And all that was there greeting us were army cots. There were uh, my mother and father, three boys, five of us, and my grandmother. So there were six of us. And we were housed in a bare room, no running water, and with uh, six army cots. Uh, we were assigned to a large family unit, six by 24, for six of us, except for beds, actually army cots, there was no furniture. And we, uh, my grandmother was, was very upset about this whole experience. So my father strung a rope around the back of the room, uh, hung a blanket on it, on the, over the rope, put my grandmother's cot behind the blanket, and it seemed to me as a child, my grandmother spent most of her time behind the blanket on her army pot, secluded from the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. No running water. We had to walk 100 yards to the bathroom. Uh, when you have a, a child or children in diapers, no running water, no way to clean them up. My father uh, dug a hole through the floor and dug a pit below the, uh, below the barracks and set up a little wash basin so my mother could uh, clean up the baby as, as necessary and, and let the water drain into this little cesspool, if you will. 
the next slide, the, the construction was typically army. We had one bath, one laundry room, no washing machines, no dryers. They were just uh, washboards. Does anybody know what a washboard is? <laughs> this is a great audience. When I talk to, to high schoolers, they have no idea what a washboard yes. And uh, napa soap, yes. And, uh, and a top. Um, and uh, they were uh, available, these facilities were available for each barrack block. And my block was, uh, I'll never forget, block 15, barrack 8. Room E. So that's just indelibly. After almost 60, 70 years, 15-8-E. Don't get lost. <laughs> and there were about 200 to 250 people per block. So that, uh, that, uh, that calculates into well over 10,000 people living in these 36 blocks. Next, next slide. Here's a photograph of our block. And you can see all the children. And what, what, stu what really stunned me was, if you look carefully, there are very few men in this, in this photograph. So you wonder where all the men are. Well, some of them were working in the fields. Um, in the, after the first year in the camps, uh, they cultivated about 250 acres of, of irrigated farmland that they grew over two million pounds of produce uh, inside of this camp. Where are all the men? Actually, when my when we first moved to the camp in uh, September, my father almost left almost immediately and began to work on the harvest of the sugar beet. And the, during that time, there was such a shortage of manpower that they took men out of the camps leaving the families behind in the detention camps and use them to harvest the sugar beet. My father never came, didn't come home till after Thanksgiving, after the harvest. So here's my mother with a child that is very upset. They settled into their barracks, and then my father leaves for another two or three months. No hot water, trying to get used to the, these conditions. And what, what, I, what really strikes me is that you see all the children and there at the very end is my mother, standing with the three boys, trying to be very close to them. Next slide. So in the summertime, it was not only the heat, but the dust. And the dust was all pervasive. It was fine. It got into everything. It got into the barracks. Uh, there was dust on your bed clothes. Uh, and in the wintertime, there were periods of zero degree weather, it got as cold as minus 20 degrees below zero. For us New Englanders, that's nothing. <laughs> but we had no insulation. I would wake up with, uh, with snow on my bed. Um, and in the fall and spring, the rains left a sea of mud. So we really had mud season even before New Hampshire knew what mud season was like. <laughs> with three kids, active kids, you need I say more. And in fact, the, the children, uh, my brother Jerry, who cried a lot, got into a lot of trouble. Uh, he would run from block to block, getting into trouble. One day he came home, he had fallen into someone's cesspool. And, and I can still remember, he was just covered with indescribably bad stuff. <laughs> and it, it was a major problem in the, in the camps because it was a dissolution of the family structure. And when you grow up in a Japanese home, it's highly stratified and, and it's highly structured. And here, kids are running feral in these camps. Next slide. Uh, this, this is great. Uh, each, each room, whether it's large or small, had a cold stove. Every year for the season, the Army would order 40,000 tons of coal, and there would be a big coal pile outside of our, uh, out of our wash house. And every day I'd have to go with a coal bucket, fill it up, and stoke the coal stove. But what concerns me now as a, as a parent or a grandparent is that there was no, uh, no uh, 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 fence or protective around the, the stove. And I'm sure the Consumer Product Safety Committee would not have a good time with that. 
But I can remember getting uh, waking up at night and seeing the red glow of that coal stove just giving off a lot of heat. But having two toddlers running loose in this room with this coal stove, I, I'm just astounded that there weren't even more burn injuries. Next slide. I went to, uh, I, I was in kindergarten in Eatonville, first grade and second grade in, in, uh, in Minidoka, the internment camp. And every day, every day we would gather and pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Next slide. Well, in 1943, the Army decided that they would take volunteers from the camps. And so they went around. The Army had uh, representatives going to each camp asking for volunteers to fight against in World War II. Now, as you can imagine, there was a lot of opposition. People would say, why should we go and look what you're doing to us? You put us behind barbed wire, and now you want us to put our lives on the line and defend this country? On the other hand, my grandfather, when he passed away, before he passed away, instructed the boys by saying, <clears throat> there will be a war between the United States and Japan at some time. I want you to be loyal to the United States. <coughs> and so, here's a photograph of the, of the four boys and their children as they uh, were listening to the uh, appeal for, for volunteers. And this is what my grandfather said. You are Japanese, my sons, but you are citizens of this country <clears throat> whose soil has blessed us. Conduct yourselves with dignity and honor this country of your birth. This is my grandfather, 1919. So my, uh, <clears throat> my father and his three brothers all volunteered. They were the first of a group of 300 men who volunteered to serve in the U.S. Army, and he went off to train at Camp Shelby with the all Japanese 442nd Regimental Combat Team. There was a lot of conflict within the camp discussing whether men should volunteer. My, uh, there was a uh, town meeting, and we know what town meetings can be. <laughs> uh, there was a lot of uh, heated discussion. Almost, uh, there were there were some men who almost came to blows with my grandmother. And so my grandmother commanded them to sit down uh, because these boys, her boys, are going to fight in the U.S. Army. <clears throat> so my father in 1943 went off to the war, uh, and we didn't see him only sporadically until the end of the war. He joined uh, uh, a very distinguished military intelligence service uh, that worked on translating Japanese messages and uh, many of the uh, MIS uh, Japanese American soldiers went to the Pacific Theater to serve as interpreters during the invasion of the various uh, campaigns in the South Pacific. A very dangerous job, almost to the point where some of the Marines would uh, threaten to shoot the MIS interpreters thinking they were the enemy in disguise. In the next slide, here's my father. Uh, after he had finished his basic training, his photograph was taken by a clandestine photo, uh, camera because cameras were not generally allowed in the camps. But my mother was not very happy about uh, my father. He was 39 years old, he enlisted in the U.S. Army, and she said, Chester, you enlisted and I give you my approval, and that's because I can't do anything with three young children. You don't have to join the Army. But my father insisted, and off he went to Camp Shelby and ultimately to, uh, to uh, serve in the MIS. Next slide. This, this is a slide that I really had trouble with this, in this presentation. Because if you recall the, the photographs of pre, the pre-war photographs, the, the boys were well dressed. They had matching suits, matching sailor suits. Everything was, was an expression of my mother's love for, for the boys. And here you have us sitting on a pile of rock, dust-laden 
hand-me-down clothes, and my mother trying the best to cope with a very, very difficult situation. We looked like refugees with clothes from the <coughs> Salvation Army, barracks in the background. My mother tried to make life as normal as possible. She, she would take us on picnics to the edge of the barbed wire fence underneath the shadow of the watchtower and we, we would walk through rattlesnake infested sagebrush to the fence and have a picnic. It was my mother's attempt to have as normal of life as possible. But my father did admit after the war that the intervening time after leaving for service and until the end of the war it was a struggle for Agnes and my mother. And if you recall seeing my mother as a young mother at the, in the camps celebrating the August Moon Festival, and you see her over a period of time, it, did, it took a terrible toll on my mother. Next slide. Well, uh, we were often, we were occasionally allowed to go on vacation from the camps. And uh, the, uh, uh, the minister of the Japanese Baptist Church took us to a Bible camp in Sun Valley. And uh, here's his son, Brooks Andrews, and my brother Jerry. And uh, my father had sent me uh, from Camp Shelby a t-shirt where he had been doing his uh, performing his basic training. So this was a wonderful time for us as a family to get away from the camps. And uh, I even learned how to swim <coughs> that summer. Next slide. So, in 1944, we were allowed by the U.S. government to move eastbound. We were given a $25 cash allowance and a one-way train ticket east. And we were sponsored by uh, the American Home Baptist Organization, and they found a farmer in Wisconsin who would be our sponsor. So from 1941, when we were living in our Japanese community, my father had his new car. Suddenly we were eastbound on a troop train heading for points unknown, a farm in Wisconsin. Mm. And the story goes that uh, the, the train stopped late in the evening or late afternoon in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Mm. The boys were left, my mother left the three boys on the train uh, and got off, went into the station to get food. And suddenly the train started moving out of the station with the three boys on the troop train. She ran down the platform, managed to get on the train, and to be reunited with the three boys. And even to this day, I think about what would I do as the eldest son on a troop train, he is heading into the night. My mother on the platform, was, we're heading for points unknown. But fortunately, we survived and my mother was rejoined with the three boys. The next slide shows where we ended up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And after several stops in, uh, in studio apartments in various uh, parts of the city, we were accepted into public housing. It was like Nirvana. It was like we had, we had finally made it into the real world uh, my father wrote in a letter, Agnes was admitted to the Parkland Housing Project and a $20 month rent was a nice relief and a great place for children. And there we are at Parklawn. And Parklawn, the whole public housing program in Milwaukee was the brainchild of the mayor, Frank Zeidler. Frank Zeidler was the last socialist mayor in this country. <laughs> and we benefited from public housing, public dentistry, public medical help. We, we took, there was a safety net that, that saved us after this long journey from the foothills of Mount Rainier to the public housing in, in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Next slide. So in 1946, my dad came home, and concurrently with my dad came home, my brother Bruce showed up. 
So we are finally reunited again after about five years. There's Bruce, my brother, Jerry, who is on the right, Chet, and myself in Park Lawn. And I, I can say that it was, it was a wonderful time for our family. And it wasn't until the mid-50s that we had enough money to move out of public housing. And by that time, my father was about in his late 40s, early 50s. We saved up enough money to buy our first home for $16,000. <laughs> Next slide. Well, the story moves on from the 1940s, 50s, and in the 1970s and 80s, the third generation, the Sansei, my generation, began making noise about reparations, about what happened to, to the Issei and Nisei, and something has to be done about it. And the younger generation took up this as a cause. There, uh, there was a play written by a friend of ours uh, called Don't Fence Me In, and it, this was part of the beginning of a redress effort that was started by the Sansei generation. 1980, President Carter signed into law uh, the establishment of a presidential commission to, to examine what happened, the causes, and the remedy for the internment. In 1988, uh, Ronald Reagan signed into law the Civil Liberties Act that uh, that awarded each internee a $20,000 check and an apology. In 1991, George Herbert Walker Bush sent me this letter. And it reads in part, we can never fully right the wrongs of the past but we can take it a clear stand for justice and recognize that serious injustices were done to the Japanese Americans during World War II. George Herbert Walker Bush. In 1991, or correct me, the last uh, week of President uh, uh, Clinton, Clinton uh, last week of President Clinton, he established by proclamation the Minidoka Internment National Monument. And there we have. The picture, the next slide, shows in 2001 the establishment of the Minidoka Internment National Monument located in southern Idaho. And each year there's a pilgrimage to Minidoka held by the survivors to commemorate the time that we spent as a community in Minidoka. And uh, Mary Ellen and I and our daughter Mia had the privilege of attending. Our son was a, a guest speaker at that, at that uh, pilgrimage. Uh, and in subsequent years, Congress has allocated $36 million for an educational program. Uh, $36 million to be issued in grants to uh, commemorate, to teach, to memorialize the internment experience here in the United States, of which about 20 million of that, 36 million, has been already awarded to various civic groups throughout the country. So this, I think, concludes my talk. Um, in the next slide, I'd like to acknowledge Dixie Walters, who is the editor of the Eatonville Dispatch, who uh, provided me with the letters, my father's letter. Eugene Laird, who was a publisher, who was very brave in publishing the letters from the camp in the face of public opposition, uh, the Bancroft Library and the Sakura family letters. So in closing, let me just say that in the next slide, I have a photograph of my father. In the next slide, my father, after my mother passed away in 1974, moved to Kenya, where my brother was running a medical mission station, and my father was the radio operator. But I recall the, the last letter he wrote to the Eatonville Dispatch on Christmas 1943. He said, in these columns I repeat time and time again, 
how glad we are to be Americans. I always repeat back home a lot because that means so much to us. It's like a childhood memory, uh, only more vivid, and we'll be back someday. Chester Sephora, 1943. We never did go back, but our memories of Eaton Mill are still very strong. Thank you very much. I know it's very warm in here, uh, so uh, I'll take a few questions. If you have any. No. How many um, how many people are still living who uh, you know, were, had shared your experience? Well, uh, I have to say that I don't know the exact number, but there were sixty thousand recipients of the $20,000 redress payment uh, in 1990. But I, I, I'm probably one of the youngest of the survivors of that particular episode. Why do you think it wasn't the backlash of extreme in the power? Uh, there, there are a number of reasons. One could be economic. Uh, many of the Japanese farmers had very bad, had converted you know, uh, agricultural land to a highly productive uh, land, and both the uh, the California Farmers Growers Association were adamant that the Japanese be be, uh, be uh, incarcerated. Also, if I look around the room, you all look like Americans, except. <laughs> one Asian guy. <laughs> and it's a lot easier to pick out the one Asian guy versus a German, Italian, and the like. But in Hawaii, uh, the Japanese population was almost a third of the entire island population. They were never interned because economically it would have been a disaster for the island. So there, there has to be some racial overtone, some oh, racial intent in, in this. Uh, in the back, wait. Uh, Hi. Oh, oh, yeah. oh uh, in, in one of the slides, uh, you said, well, like, here's your brother who has joined us uh, finally or something. Where was your brother? Oh. <laughs> in, in my mother's tummy. Oh. <laughs> My grandmother was, uh, uh, she has what's called a, she was uh, Grandma Kondo. So my mother was Al Agnes Kondo and the Sakura side. The Kondo side is, is, is very uh, uh, contentious, <laughs> as illustrated by my grandmother. <laughs> uh, and she, she had a really hard time with the boys and, and the like. Uh, I think they all lived into their 80s. Uh, gentlemen, class. You, you talked about the, uh, the Chinese exclusion issues in yes. Seattle. Yes. Were Japanese discriminated against on the West Coast before the war? Well, I, in 1924, and this has resonance for today's experiences, it was an anti Asian act that forbid any immigration from Asia. It, it was a blanket ban on immigrants from Asia in 1924. It wasn't lifted until the uh, McCarran Act after, after uh, World War II. So I think ban on certain individuals is not a contemporary issue. Garrett. Hey, the two questions. The first is, do you know whether national monuments have been established in any of the other yes. camps? Yeah. Most of the other camps are national monuments, and uh, all of them have very active programs of education, 
uh, and outreach. Uh, a friend of mine sits on the board for the Park Mountain uh, internment camp. Uh, and and what's, what I think is really interesting is that the Sasanse, the third generation, and even the fourth generation, have picked up the story and continue to uh, talk about the story. My other question is, so there have been uh, extensive studies of long-term mental health outcomes on, on groups like Holocaust survivors and Vietnamese boat people. Do you know whether there have been any studies on, on Japanese-American internment victims? There, there have, and I think there's a strong cultural aspect. There's, there's, a, there's a saying in Japanese that you have to endure hardship. Just endure. Uh, and I think that that was part of the um, the uh, ethos of the Japanese who were in the camps. And to illustrate that, um, if you think about the camps, there are lots of different interpretations of the camp. But this is one interpretation of life in the camp. It's our yearbook. <laughs> it's our yearbook. And in the yearbook, you have. It's like your class picture, your 10th your grade picture. Well, this is a picture of the people in block 15. But also, you have, uh, you have various groups, the agriculture 4F group, the band, the, uh, the high school chorus. It, it's like, could it be denial? Yeah. 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 Uh, here we have the choral group. This could be at uh, PSU. <laughs> so there, there's something I think unique about the way the Japanese uh, managed the internment. But I think there are larger issues to consider, especially what's going on today, about how fragile our rights under the Constitution is, and how easily, by mob rule, it can be overthrown. I'll, I'll take one more question. It's getting hot. Yeah. Yeah. Right here. Yes. Thank you. I was. I have to say that I was 13 in 1942, <laughs> and we discussed this at home. I'm going to cry now because my parents were very upset. Yes. They were very upset about this. Even though I had a brother who went to the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. But I want to say it's very important. Mm -hmm. So, where did you live? In New York City. Yes. Yeah. <coughs> well, I, I should say that there, there are many friends who came to help. The, the, the Quakers, the American Home Service. There was an art festival held in Cambridge, Massachusetts with paintings that were, were made in the camps, the, the Quakers. Uh, there was a, the Levi Strauss family sponsored a mass migration of college age students to colleges throughout the New England and the East Coast. We need a college, Bowdoin and the like. And many of those graduates who benefited from the Levi Strauss Foundation's efforts to move them out of the camps have formed a scholarship fund uh, that I'm privileged to sit on the finance committee and we distribute over twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 worth of scholarships to newly arrived Asians to this country. How are meals we were uh, We were in the bed in the mess hall and we had typical army food. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, complaining by civilians outside of the camps that uh, we were being treated better than the prisoners of war. <laughs> so the, the the government, in its wisdom, figured out how much it cost to feed us: forty-three cents a day. But we were being fed much better than the prisoners of war. In fact, they thought that there were some who were quite vocal about sending us all back to Japan during the war, or even after the war. <laughs>
Wow. One more. Just <laughs> anecdotally, uh, I grew up in Southern California. Yes. And, and we moved to a community of uh, Torrance in 1945. Yes. Yep. And our closest friends were the Shinodas. Yep. And they had just come out of the camps. And apparently, just before they had gone in, I was too young to know this directly, but he had a, a, a carnation and orchid uh, nursery. Oh, and fortunately, his best friend took care of it while he was in turn. Mm -hmm. And he was able to get it back when he returned to turn. So he was very fortunate. The <coughs> fields beyond my house that I used to play in as mm -hmm. a child, every spring we'd grow these beautiful flowers. And I had no idea at that time that these were the gardens that were owned by Japanese families. So, and, and when I would travel north to, to Washington State yeah. during the summer, we would see the internment camps yeah. in Northern California. So. Uh, before I close, I want to bring to your attention uh, a couple of books. There's, there's a little uh, library of books about the internment. Uh, there are two that I'd like to draw your attention to. This is one of my absolute favorite all-time books. If you like the, the book um, Unbroken, yeah. Yeah. this book is comparable to Unbroken. Mm -hmm. it, it talks about a young man who grew up, uh, and he was a, actually he was a Nisei, second generation. He grew up in outside of Seattle. Uh, his father passed away. They moved as a family before the war to Hiroshima. He came back after high school, was an intern, <laughs> went into the U.S. Army, served as an interpreter, served in the Pacific uh, Theater, and was one of the first to go back to Japan after the bombing of Hiroshima, where his mother and father and brothers had stayed during the war. Midnight in broad daylight. And there's a uh, picture book, there's a, uh, a book of uh, narratives by uh, individuals who were uh, put into Minidok internment camp. Uh, this book was uh, put together by a woman in the, on the West Coast, Teresa Tamara. And it's a wonderful book because it has more stories of what it was like living in the camps. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Enjoy